good evening everyone good evening everyone welcome to welcome to eacp webinars good evening everyone welcome to eacp web aac uh, webinar series today we have with us uh, dr goldin from uh, saka so under the uh, live theme we are conducting the series of webinars so life is an india led global movement to protect and preserve the environment life was introduced by prime minister narendra modi ji at the cop 26 in glasgow on november 2021 uh, which is a mass movement for mindful and deliberate utilization instead of less destructive consumption of the natural resources and also it aims to protect and preserve the environment so india is the first country to include life in its uh, nationally de uh, determined contribution to propagate a healthy and sustainable way of living so based on its traditions and the values for the conservation and modernization including to the mass movement for life as a key to combat the climate change so with this vision of life uh, they are uh, promoting the lifestyle which can be tuned with a uh, probe to the planet and which does not harm to the planet as well as natural resources so mission life brings the uh, balance the past and operates in the present and focus on the future so with this regard uh, eacp uh, english of science try to Uh, uh, to create awareness among the youngsters as well as students and researchers. So, in this regard, we are conducting a series of webinars. Under this uh, theme, we have with us Dr. Golden Quadros, who has been working in Saka from uh, past 2011, and also he is expert is in uh, wetland ecology. Prior to joining the Saka, he has worked in several uh, institutions of the excellence, and uh, some of them are WWF India. and also uh, he has worked in mumbai university uh, uh, he has also uh, worked as a education officer in wwf and also uh, worked as a uh, officiating state director so he has studied uh, his alumni of uh, mumbai university and also he has guided uh, various phd students as well as, as master students he has published uh, eight books and uh, 29 uh, conference proceedings in national and international conferences and also he has published uh, four international uh, peer reviewed articles and uh, 20 national peer reviewed articles and he has uh, uh, been working as a uh, uh, teacher and also he has been uh, working as a uh, trainer and also he has shared his vast research experience among the students and he has specific uh, specialization in benthic uh, fauna and also uh, intertidal regions of the coast estuaries and creeks so uh, he has contributed various projects in saka as well as various other nations he has been associated with various organizations under wetland regulation so he is also working on the ramsar convention uh, for identifying some of the wetlands as a uh, ramsar, uh, ramsar sites of the importance so uh, with this brief introduction i request uh, dr bolding to share is you and the people and how the man should let it be protecting the biodiversity as well as uh, uh, protecting the uh, resources uh, for the next generation i request uh, dr goldin to uh, share his vast experience with respect to the mangroves sir over to you sir yeah yeah thank you dr bharat uh, Uh, i just like to know whether i'm audible because i can hear yes, sir, you're audible you're audible sir you're audible sir you're audible sir okay fine uh, so yes, the topic has dr bharat uh, has very graciously introduced is role of mangrove ecosystem in the conservation of biodiversity so as we proceed ahead uh, i would just okay yeah um just introduce as to you know what are mangroves we will go as to you know what are mangroves uh, how is it important and what it supports and what are the dangers that are uh, there for the mangroves basically so uh, mangroves are something that is much misunderstood or uh, are not understood at all because if you go to see down history it was only in the 70s 1970s that people or scientists woke up to um, the importance of mangroves or the existence of mangrove ecosystem uh, i don't know what is the problem but uh, i'm getting an echo so 
Are you all getting an echo? Is it a single voice? I will check, sir. One second. One second. Otherwise, I'll just end the show and I'll get back. Just see whether. Actually, it's clear to everyone. So maybe So you are on mute. Okay. Uh, now is it visible? It's visible and it's very clear, sir. Actually, earlier also it was very clear. Okay. Uh, this was the first slide. slide. This was the first slide. Now the second slide, right? Shush. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay. So mangroves are something that are misunderstood, as I was saying, uh, or rather not understood at all, because even the scientists who woke up, like we all woke up to understanding of mangroves only in the 1970s when uh, uh, you know there were a lot of uh, destruction that was going habitat change was happening and uh, gradually you know we f fell into line to understand what are mangroves uh, and not mango grows basically and uh, these are basically or were basically considered as swampy dangerous lands which only breed mosquitoes and um, snakes so it was something that was dangerous to go along the coast wherever there was mangroves so um, the, uh, if one has to see uh, water mangroves, these are coastal vegetation. They occur mostly in the tropical and subtropical region of the world. They are the plants which can tolerate um, extreme fluctuations of uh, salt, uh, uh, right from something like 1 ppt to something like even uh, 35 to 40 p parts per thousand. Uh, because in certain estuaries and creeks, uh, the sal salinity becomes, the water becomes hypersaline and uh, the plants have to adjust to get tolerated, you know, to such extreme uh, uh, fluctuations of salinity and temperature and all the uh, harsh um, climate con climatic conditions over there. So if one goes down history, the word mangrove originates from the Portuguese uh, word mango, uh, meaning into the sea and grove is a garden. So that was uh, how it originated. And uh, mangroves have been on this planet Earth for nearly 65 million years. And uh, they can be categorized into old world mangroves and the new world mangroves. Old world mangroves are basically East, uh, you know, in the East African region, Indo-Malaysia and Australasia. While the new mangroves are in uh, West America, 
East America, Western Africa. And if one goes to see the species diversity, the eastern mangroves have got much more diversity of plants than as compared to the Western mangroves. Mm. Uh, like where they occur, it, circumtropically they are found uh, in 124 countries and there are some countries which have taken up uh, mangrove uh, plantation and also the number of countries or small places are just growing up. Uh, I wouldn't say that, you know, planting mangroves in places where they did not exist is a good idea, but uh, where uh, wherever it is suitable or possible, uh, one has to think uh, you know, in a very positive manner and understand what are the implications that it would have rather than just trying to increase the mangrove cover also. Though we need mangroves, uh, mangroves need to be protected because they provide a lot of benefits. And region wise, if you go to see 41% um, uh, of the mangroves exist in South and Southeast Asia to East Africa, Middle East having the minimum of 5.7% and uh, so on. If the top three countries are there are seen, it is uh, Indonesia, Brazil and Australia where uh, the mangrove cover is maximum uh, like that. And uh, the uh, distance wise, if you see, it is like mangroves exist in uh, Japan, uh, almost up to 32 degrees north and Bermuda uh, down as well as in New Zealand, Australia up to 30 degrees in the southern southern region. In India, if you go to see, uh, mangroves are distributed along all the coastal regions as well as Andamans and Nic Nicobar Islands and uh, uh, the Union territories also have the mangroves with the mangrove cover, the recent uh, cover showing something like um, 4,992 square kilometers of mangrove. So if one has to see the zonation, uh, mangroves basically are found along uh, where the fresh water meets the saline water. So it is an intermediate zone. So the salinity may not be very high or may, or it may not be completely fresh water, though the mangroves or the plants do need um, some amount of uh, fresh water for their secondary growth. And if one goes to see that, you know, it is during the monsoon season that the uh, mangroves grow very fast as compared to other seasons. Uh, uh, they exist in this uh, swampy saline region because uh, it is sort of a competitive competition that they give to the terrestrial plants. So if the terrestrial plants uh, try to grow over here, they have to compete with the mangroves as far as uh, you know their adaptation to the saline ecosystem is concerned. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, if one sees, if one goes to the coast, it is usually from the mid tide level to the towards the high tide level that the mangroves are in large uh, numbers and they grow towards the sea. And that was also one of the reasons why it was called as, you know, the mangroves built land. Uh, that is because they have got such an intricate uh, network of roots. Uh, they could be either nematophores or they could be the prop roots or there are plank roots and all, you know, all these adaptations just help in restricting the flow of silt and thereby creating land and that is what uh, uh, gives them a superior uh, position along the coastal region where they also help in several environmental natural disasters and all that happen otherwise. Mm, uh, so if uh, one has to walk into the mangroves, one has to be careful because the substratum is loose because there is uh, water plus there is uh, the um, soil, silt and clay that is there that add up to the uh, loose ecosystem and it also provides um, say nursery ground and it because of their root system it acts like a you know uh, wind breaker or a uh, you know storm breaker sort of thing and if one uh, tries to remember the tsunami or the cyclones of Orissa that uh, these mangroves have helped in preventing uh, the landward damage. So adaptations if one goes to see the uh, plants exclude salt at the leaf level also. So um, it, they have got these glands through which uh, uh, the water, whatever excess salt is there, they just excrete. And if you go into the mangroves in a mangrove forest, you'll find that there is a layer of salt usually on the leaves. That is because uh, they do not consume that salt, but they just throw it off as an excretory matter. So that remains on the leaf and that is how they are able to grow in that uh, region basically. Um, uh, uh, salt may accumulate on the older leaves before they fall and when they fall they become um, uh, nutritious and rich in the soil and that supports a lot of other organisms and all. Then as I was just saying, talking about the prop roots, 
there are roots that come out from the uh, main bark of the uh, plant and that forms like a silt the uh, stilt sorry and helps in supporting the entire uh, plant to withstand in that uh, marshy condition so the plank roots are here which um, help uh, you know stabilize the plant then there are these nematophores which have got small uh, pores on it which help it to absorb oxygen because um otherwise these plants grow in anaerobic uh, condition where there is very poor oxygenation in the soil and uh, for the plant to get some oxygen from that anaerobic region these nematophores that you see over here which has got pores absorb the oxygen from the air and provide it to the plant so there are several adaptation like even um, the young seedlings there's this uh, system of viviparity wherein the young plants grow on the mother plant uh young saplings grow on the mother plant till it can tolerate the harsh conditions of the soil and uh, after it is capable to withstand the mother plant will drop the uh, seedling into the soil where it will establish itself and grow into the new plant so who lives here it is like you know because there are mangroves there is leaf litter there is water coming in there are several organisms big and small that live over here and uh, uh, help in um, the entire biodiversity chain right from uh, microorganisms to the uh, largest species uh, uh, charismatic species that can be found over there so uh, there was a study uh, or other compilation by dr sandilian and kathiresan in uh, 2012 and uh, they have documented something like 4011 species uh, from the indian mangroves now i wouldn't say that this is complete uh, if we do a uh, review of literature now i'm sure their number would go much higher because uh, there are several species that were not identified before um, could have even added up now and the number of uh, species both flora as well as fauna will go up and uh, the species number uh, will increase and uh, somehow fortunately if one goes through literature it is for india we have got this uh, number of species that has been documented several other countries there is not enough literature available to know how much species exist uh, in the mangrove ecosystem and that is also one of the uh, say bad things that you know we cannot Uh, help or contribute towards conservation of species now uh, like in the earlier slide where i have shown over 4000 species uh, these are some of the species that are there like you know this is phytoplankton phytoplankton uh, is the plant plankton plankton are basically organisms or uh, 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 life that cannot swim on its own uh, it cannot uh, it does not have the power of moving from one place to the other but it will drift along with the currents the water currents the water flow uh, has and how it goes so depending on the nutrition that is available in the water the phytoplankton will uh, grow in large numbers and sometimes if it is uh, if there is excess of nutrition in the water in terms of nitrate and phosphate then these phytoplankton will consume them and uh, some of these species which are actually not good will proliferate in large numbers and that is that will lead to eutrophication all such things happen in the uh, you know around the mangrove ecosystem but phytoplankton if they play the normal role they will help the zooplankton and provide them with food so the phytoplankton is then fed by zooplankton that is the zoo uh, the, the animal forms of plankton here where the uh, swimming capacity is very minimal so even they would depend on uh, the waves the um, wind current the uh, water current for their movement and there would be uh, permanent planktons as well as uh, temporary planktonic uh, forms that are available uh they could be your egg uh, uh this eggs of fish and several other crustaceans and other uh, invertebrates and vertebrates uh, invertebrates mostly uh, that would be there in the water plus there are some life forms which will be planktonic in nature for the entire uh, uh, life cycle so they will feed on the phytoplankton uh and then the phytoplankton is, is fed by several other groups of or organisms like you have these polychaete worms the annelid worms that are there that feed on either phytoplankton or other detritus matter and uh, you know uh, recycle 
the nutrition that is there they convert it uh, into usable form uh, there are gastropods who are mostly herbivores so they feed on the uh, phytoplankton that settles down on the uh, soil or the benthic layer and uh, you know be a part of the uh, food chain uh, then there are several uh, smaller organisms uh, or the invertebrates like the crabs the yucca species um is something that is very charismatic of the mango ecosystem uh, i like to always talk about this uh, crab species you know uh, because uh, when you go to a coast you always get to see them communicate with each other with each other in a sense one crab talking to other crab uh, it would be either to guard its territory or it would be there if uh, it has to tell the uh, other female crab because it is a male crab that would have one chile that is larger the other chile is smaller smaller in size so it will use its chile to um, indicate to the female uh, whose both chiles are of the same size where the food availability is there where the protection is there um, and you know accordingly they will guard its territory and all and uh, it's not that only the yucca species communicates with each other all crabs uh, do have some system of communication and uh, that goes on so the here is the hermit crab also that lives in the mangrove ecosystem and uh, uh, it does not have a very hard exoskeleton along its uh, abdomen so what it does it takes uh, discarded or you know the dead gastropod shells and uh, keeps its uh, abdomen in that and travels along so if it finds another shell which is bigger in size but it is occupied by another uh, hermit crab then there will be a fight between the two hermit crabs to get the bigger size shell because the their bodies keep on growing so you know to accommodate their uh, growing body sizes they have to get uh, gastropod shells which are bigger in size and accordingly uh, you know uh, have a tussle with the other organisms so plus there are these insects uh several uh, you get several dragon flies and damsel flies and uh, butterflies and all there is one uh, species called as the salmon arab which is very peculiar um, of mangrove ecosystem uh, so uh, plus there is this hablia pruera which is uh, a, i don't know if you all have um, heard about this uh, defoliation happening in the mangrove ecosystems of mumbai where uh, just after the rains uh, there is an infestation of these uh, 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 moth species where they infest heavily on one species of plant called as the avicennia marina it is because it has it is rich in tannin and it will just feed on uh, this avicennia marina but it will not kill the plant it will just take or defoliate the leaf and uh, it looks like you know dead and barren land that is one drawback that is there but the mangrove ecosystems thus uh, uh, provide home to several insect types as well as reptiles uh, you even get the marsh crocodile and uh, sea anemones and all that and yes you also get the tiger if you go to sundarbans if you are lucky enough you get to see the tiger that lives inside the mangrove ecosystem so um, uh, this is something that is uh, uh, a very charismatic species that has also helped in protecting the largest uh, patch of mangroves uh, in the world uh, and also providing uh, livelihood at the same time to several um, human species also as well as uh, providing food to the animals and contributing to the food chain and if one goes to gujarat there are these kharai camels uh, that are found uh, these are basically found in the mangrove ecosystem they are also called as the swimming camels they feed on the uh, mangrove over there and they have this capacity of uh, swimming in the mangrove ecosystem somehow because of the degradation of mangroves because of uh, human encroachment because of uh, increased human intervention um, these Uh, camels are facing a habitat loss problem and so the number of camels that used to exist in uh, this uh, gujarat region the coastal region the uh, region of the mangroves the kutch region and all has just gone down and uh, it, but it is a charismatic sight to see these uh, species over there and yes uh, there are birds birds form the most attractive thing for everything right from tourism uh, now ecotourism and uh, you know they would indicate whether the health of the ecosystem is good enough so you know they form 
uh, the attraction for human uh, humans to go towards the mangrove ecosystem it gives a face for the ecosystem to be uh, recognized at that it is an ecosystem and it needs to be protected because this is the form uh, you know where uh, there are several bird watchers that go to see birds because even these ecosystems are part of migratory pathways across uh, asia and southeast asia and all that so the birds migrate from several countries come to india go to europe and all that so um, you know uh, following the path of the migratory pathway and if we disturb a mangrove ecosystem we lose out on several birds that exist so if you go to see uh, there are 146 species approximately 47 uh, percent are long distance migrants uh, which do not nest in India. Out of that, if uh, the, the, this, the mangrove ecosystem is disturbed, if the mud flats are disturbed, the food is disturbed, the species would just reduce uh, or, you know, uh, it, it gets impacted very heavily. Uh, uh, when we look at the threatened, uh, the IUCN threatened category of uh, birds, uh, there are something like over 308 species of birds that are there five are critically endangered nine are endangered 20 are vulnerable and 32 are near threatened species these include the spoonbill sandpiper which rarely um, uh, is seen nowadays uh, earlier the last sighting was probably some 20 25 years um, ago somewhere around the orissa coast and uh, some of these species though they are sighted they are very less in number yeah, so uh, there are some 17 odd species which are uh, falling directly, you know, the, that use the mangrove habitat, something like around 60 species use uh, mangrove habitat directly. And there are some uh, 17 to 18 species uh, which are either um, endangered or threatened or critically endangered or vulnerable. And uh, I have not gone to um, put over here which one is critically endangered or vulnerable. But then these are a few of the species where uh, habitat loss is impacting uh, these birds majorly. So. Uh, these are these are those uh, 17 species and flamingos also are a uh, part of these endangered uh, the bird list uh, though in india we do have good number of uh, uh, flamingos that are there but it is also counted at the global scale so internationally uh, if you go to see these birds numbers are reduced have reduced but in India, you do get them in good numbers. But then overall, at the global scale, when you see uh, it comes to uh, the vulnerable level over here. Yeah, so importance of mangroves, if you go to see uh, from the commercial point of view, uh, mangroves provide fuel and timber. Uh, in good old days, uh, I have read documents where, you know, uh, before when the telephone lines were there, where we used to have landline connection in our houses. So uh, there was this plant called, uh, is this plant, there is this plant called Rhizophora. So their stem grows tall. So these trees were usually logged and uh, uh, Rhizophora trees were used as uh, telephone lines and electricity. Apart from burning for tin timber and all that, uh, these were used for that specific purpose. Um, it, it provides tannins and dyes. Uh, you go in Southeast Asia, you will get mangrove tea, uh, like, you know, Avicennia tree or Cereops tea. These are names of plants that are there where, you know, those uh, species are dried and uh, they are used for tea purposes, uh, preparing tea. That is because they are, the content of tannin in them is higher and uh, it matches almost to our regular tea that uh, we get. So uh, you do get them and then uh, how we use them, is something that depends on us but if we have to look in india uh, if we have to use plant teas or rather mangrove trees uh, we have to keep in mind uh, the pollution content also because uh, mangroves are known to uh, you know uh, trap good amount of heavy metals so if we end up having uh, that kind of thing you know it may be detrimental to our health plus there are several studies where Mangroves are used for medicinal purposes. Uh, it is used for food and fodder. Fodder, uh, the cattle uh, and goats basically, you know, uh, they just love feeding on uh, the salty uh, mangrove fodder because it gives them a lot of nutrition. It gives them a lot of uh, minerals and all that. So they prefer that. Uh, the honey that is done uh, 
uh, or obtained from the mangroves is highly prized uh, and it is exported it is a form of good livelihood aquaculture is something natural aquaculture is good but then you know that is something that has actually impacted uh, the mangroves because it all started in southeast asia where large patches of mangroves would be just destroyed and aquaculture ponds would be created this started from the fact that people knew that you know you get good amount of fish uh, in the mangrove areas why because mangroves act as a nursery ground they are good feeding breeding grounds so they felt that if they cut down mangroves made depressions for aquaculture and uh, you know uh, try to grow uh, fish it would be beneficial yes it was beneficial for a year two three years gradually the productivity declined and that is how it started impacting the mangroves also uh, there was loss of mangrove destruction of uh, the feeding grounds and detriment to the ecosystem also so uh, it, it is like you know a commercial thing was taken into consideration but it impacted then there is this ecotourism like you go to sundarbans you go to pichavaram mangroves you get to see different kinds of mammals you get to see birds uh, insects and also it gives a livelihood option to the mang uh, to the people surrounding or sitting uh, um, living around the mangroves ecological benefits as i said it acts as a buffer uh, the famous uh, or the well known thing is the um, pichavaram mangroves uh, that played a crucial role during the tsunami in 2004 where the life and property of people living behind the mangroves was not much affected as compared to people where the mangroves were totally denuded and uh, like it is said that you know mangroves reclaim land from the sea so it helps in conservation um, of the ecosystem behind that is the terrestrial region also but it is not something that you know it reclaims land it stops siltation and that is misunderstood and misused uh, by the community nursery and feeding grounds as i already uh, told and uh, mangroves are important for sustaining corals because corals require clean clear pure water but if there is siltation uh, if uh, you know the riverine flow happens the uh, mangroves are the first barriers where they will you know prevent siltation then comes the sea grasses so sea grasses will uh, again control the extra amount of silt or turbidity that ever comes in and finally uh, the water that goes towards the coral is much clean clear pure and that is when the coralline organization uh, organisms uh, survive and uh, flourish but if mangroves are gone entire silt goes to the uh, sea grasses and sea weeds they cannot tolerate much so everything goes down to the corals and everything is reduced or rather destroyed totally the coral uh, reefs are gone so uh, this is something that needs to be important that you know it is not just the mangroves and the food species or the animal species that exist it is the supplementary things also that um, is found over there so the biodiversity is not only in the mangroves it is there in the sea grasses it is there in the uh, corals also and uh, mangroves are known to uh, you know trap pollutants uh, if you go along the coastal region you will see plastic hanging everywhere mangroves do the duty of you know trapping the plastic and not letting it go even in the uh, uh, sea so you know this is one visible thing that i'm talking about it's not something uh, very uh, uh, something that should be talk, spoken with pride that you know the misuse of plastic that we do the mangroves suffer uh, but they act as warriors from you know preventing the further uh, uh, spread of uh, plastics and all so you know we that should be controlled so you know not not just plastics even the other pollutants even the heavy metals or the pesticides or the agricultural runoff whatever happens or the chemicals that are left uh, the mangroves have immense uh, potential of you know trapping pollutants and a standing mangrove can provide much more uh, ecological benefit than a cut mangrove that is what is important so ecosystem services as i just pointed out uh, it first of all it provides livelihoods to you know large population uh, this is what i have taken from the iucn uh, wwf uh, uh, website because it is quite a picture uh, a visual thing that is there so it provides livelihood to large number of people large population in terms of fish in terms of uh, uh, say recreation and several other things uh, it, it, the mangrove ecosystem services are worth something more than 800 billion per year a standing mangrove ecosystem 
not a cut mangrove ecosystem not a just an aquaculture pond which is very transitory which is very temporary so you know uh, existing complete mangrove is something that provides much more benefits um it, uh, the mangrove ecosystem helps in climate regulation because it is known that a uh, mangrove forest can uh, trap much more carbon as compared to the terrestrial forest uh, upland forest so it is almost 3 to 5 times higher that uh the carbon is assimilated sequestered and um kept within the mangrove ecosystem but when these mangrove plants are cut it again facilitates climate change global warming all that is related so uh, as i've been saying that you know it is a fishery ground uh, several species of fish are known to um use like you know uh, it is said that the coastal marine ecosystem 80% of the fish uses the mangrove ecosystem for its uh, for the nursery potential for the uh, nutrition that is there there is tourism plus uh, water filtration uh, that happens from the effluents and the uh, uh, say uh, other pollutants that are there uh, it is used in coastal protection plus the wood is used was used as timber and fuel and is still used in certain places across the globe threats basically if you go to see as i said is <coughs> mangrove to the mangrove loss is aquaculture logging uh, growth of agriculture in those places uh, rampant destruction of mangroves uh, release of pollutants all this leading to climate change uh, we have this ambitious thing of having the sagar mala project wherein we have not given consideration to the mangrove ecosystem you know there are going to be several ports that are coming up there is going to be coastal development but at what expense where we are going to lose the mangroves we are going to lose the uh, ecosystem benefits the ecological benefits as well as the monetary benefits that we would otherwise get but uh, if it is like you know in humans hand in a man's hand without a proper thought then we are bound to lose everything for sure that is a major threat if one goes to see the major threats to the mangroves in india across the states uh, there are several things that are there uh, there is uh, agriculture prawn seed collection reduction in fresh water flow uh, natural calamities prawn farming uh, everywhere encroachment and rehabilitation agriculture development activities are predominant urbanization human population pressure pollution is everywhere in every states all across our country and that is just impacting the mangroves like i said the plastic pollution over here the effluent release encroachment for several other purposes development the salt pans that or you know the aquaculture ponds that are created it is just destroying the biodiversity that exists or the mangroves uh, potential to support biodiversity over there now um, this was a table again by uh, kathiresen and uh, sandilian on uh, what are the factors if you go to see natural factors they are very less but if you look at the man made factors you can just list them you know it goes on and on and yes ecotourism is one uh, uh, man made factor that is impacting or you know facilitating the de degradation and destruction of uh, mangroves why because in the name of ecotourism we do not conduct a sustainable tourism it is just you know uh, giving the name has eco to a tourism but conducting all uh, polluting uh, activities over there creating noise uh, cutting down uh, the mangrove forest uh playing having something like uh, call playback methods to destroy uh, or disturb the um, uh, birds and every, several other species uh, such things happen so you know these are the things that are happening at a very uh, uh, rampant place uh, there was this uh, literature that was compiled by choudhury and choudhury in 1994 where there are several species that have got extinct from the sundarban mangroves and these are all due to several human interventions not due to natural uh, uh, factors it is all due to man made factors where several species of reptiles have got wiped out from the mangroves of sundarbans birds as well as mammals so they existed the biodiversity was there mangrove was supporting but man made factors have facilitated in you know just clearing up the things looking at this paper which was uh, which had come in 2002 uh, if you look at the commodities 
uh, erosion, uh, non-productive um, uh, conversion, uh, um, extreme weather ca con this conditions and settlement, the destruction, the uh, the comparison was done over uh, something like you know 20 years or other 15 years. And in 15 years, the loss has been tremendous. From 2000 to 2005, there has been a decline in everything. I will not keep on explaining everyone, but it, it just declined, whichever the thing. Settlements have increased to such an extent that they have destroyed the uh, mangroves. Erosion has facilitated in destruction of mangroves. And if you go to see in all uh, it is not just India. It, it is like, you know, globally across uh, different countries, wherever there are mangroves, circumtropically, uh, wherever the mangroves exist, uh, the man-made factors, anthropogenic factors are superseding the natural factors. And what has this led to? Uh, from 139 species of uh, selected fishes, there are several that have gone into the critically endangered uh, to vulnerable category, you know, from least concern, they have just gone down. So same thing with the birds, over 1077 species were assessed, where again, there are several bird species that have gone down. Mammals, as I, uh, some, some of them have just got uh, wiped out. These, these are studied from the mangroves only, you know, they are uh, studied from the mangrove ecosystems across uh, the globe and uh, uh, that has been assessed to understand how much of destruction we have created. If you go to see the amphibians are the most impacted. There, the proportion of species have uh, gone into critically endangered to some have been wiped out. Like there was a mangrove frog that was there, which was last seen in 1991 and does not uh, is not seen anymore. Uh, there are several species of plants which are again uh, critically endangered to endangered to vulnerable. This is the Sundari tree, which was once very common in the Sundarbans, but uh, now their numbers are also getting affected and it's reducing. Uh, we used to also have the uh, Heritaria, uh, sorry, uh, the Phoenix uh, Palodosa plant along both the coast, east as well as west. The west coast has got only uh, something like historic records from the soil profile that you get. Otherwise, you don't get to see it very commonly or you just don't get to see it along the west coast. And then there are several other species that have just got wiped out or, you know, heading towards being wiped out. This is the list of uh, species that have been in the IUCN list and they were all being provided by yeah, you know, a refuge by the uh, mangrove ecosystem or hab habitat by the mangrove ecosystem. Uh, IUCN has prepared this comparative chart where uh, they have seen a comparison between 1996 and 2020. Uh, what has been the net change in the uh, mangrove cover? If you go to see, there has been a maximum change in mangrove cover in the negative in Asia, Asia Pacific region. Globally, it has been pretty high. It has been minus 3.4 change where the mangroves have just reduced from 1996 to 2020. And if one goes to see the uh, uh, regional and the global extent of uh, carbon stock uh, that was, you know, uh, trapped in the mangrove ecosystem, uh, instead of gaining, we have lost much more. It is like 98.1 uh, megatons of carbon stock does not uh, find mangroves or do not have uh, any habitat where that carbon could have been stocked and, uh, you know, trapped in the earth, thereby, you know, contributing to climate change or affecting climate change. There was another paper by um, uh, this IPCC NASA where it talks about where carbon storage is maximum. It is in the wetlands and the mangrove ecosystems are part of the wetlands. Uh, they can store maximum, you know, the, the potential of storing uh, carbon is maximum in the mangrove ecosystem because of uh, up to a depth of uh, one meter where it is wetter, the amount of organisms that are there will be more. So the carbon in different forms, it is not just the living biomass, it is also the dead biomass as well as the soil biomass that exists. So it is like small organisms, the roots, tree, leaves, uh, everything stores much more compared to the uh, other ecosystems that are found. 
now in india if you go to see you know maharashtra has played a very crucial uh, role in conserving mangroves uh, but before that the constitution of india in article 21 says that it is the fundamental right of preventing destruction of mangroves uh, in the country and there are several articles that have come up and several precautionary measures where mangroves have been given protection but we are not following that uh, exactly so uh, if for protection of mangroves there is also several religious uh, religion and customs that are there i will talk about one in india and one outside india so in india we have if you ever go to chidambaram there is this uh, idol over there of exocaria agalocha a mangrove plant species which is venerated by the locals uh, they are, the local belief over there is that if you protect mangroves the mangroves will protect you and that is what actually happened during the tsunami where you know uh, the mangroves really protected them uh, the people wherever they had uh, you know kept the mangroves standing it protected them and you know true to the religion or belief it helped them another thing is in kenya if you look at this picture there are several liquor bottles in this uh, structure that is created this is in between mangroves and the belief over there is that you know if you cut mangroves you will become rich and when you become rich what you will happen you will go and consume liquor and when you consume liquor it is ultimately your downfall that will happen so it is better that you know if you want to stay healthy if you want to stay fit if you want to be with the environment better don't destroy the mangroves so that you know yeah, you can stay healthy and fit without uh, getting into all this yeah another thing is you know uh maharashtra has taken another leading step of declaring uh the state mangrove tree and that is sonaresha alba uh, which is also called has the mangrove apple which is also provides livelihood to the locals over there there are several people who work for mangroves because they know that you know if they conserve mangroves whether it's a forest department whether it's a local who clears uh, the pl plastic from the mangroves this is in uh, maharashtra here in uh, odisha near chilika there is this uh, ladies group who protects the mangroves from being cut or destroyed in any way and uh, conserves mangroves there is this lady in uh, maharashtra uh, the forest department lady who also conserves uh helps or you know motivates the locals in plantation of mangrove species wherever they are denuded degraded because these people are aware as to how it supports their livelihood so you know when it supports their livelihood they know that they will get fish they will get crabs they will get um, prawns they will get uh, birds to see which can help them in tourism it will also support other life forms so it is a diversity of things that happens over there so uh, uh there is also this community led eco tourism where you know the women take out uh, um, boat rides they uh, speak about the mangroves they speak about the birds they speak about the uh, benthos that is found benthic organisms that are found and how the food chain works so that is something that is eco tourism where it is completely led by the ladies it is not that you know uh, there is loud music or cutting of mangroves and all they promote the conservation of mangroves so on this note yeah thank you so yeah if there are any questions please feel free to ask yeah so thanks a lot thank uh, for sharing the vast knowledge on uh, mangroves uh, starting from their uh, role in ecosystem along with the cultural as well as the social interaction so this shows uh, how the rich is this mangrove ecosystem and uh, has a significance for conservation so uh, there are some uh, couple of questions so one question is by ashulaba so she is asking how the increase in temperature and carbon dioxide activities affect the mangrove ecosystem see uh, hello yeah so uh, yeah. see if mangrove is standing it will definitely uh, trap carbon it will sequester carbon and at the same time because there is a good amount of uh, uh, say the green patch over there it will have sequestered uh, the carbon and brought down the temperature accordingly so it is not that you know it will uh, aid in increasing the temperature it will just facilitate in reduction of the temperature because of the green cover that is there plus whatever carbon is in the air it will use for its uh, the carbon dioxide will be used by the plant and you know it will be sequestered into the soil so that is how it uh, basically helps up yeah 
So there is another question. In our mangrove ecosystem, what are the services need to be considered for regulating uh, and how the quant how to quantify these regulating services? Hmm. There are several uh, ecosystem services uh, that are there. So regulating services, uh, uh, see, basically one has to do one thing that, you know, one should not uh, try to cut mangroves at all. So once you have protected the mangroves, definitely, you know, you have regulated a lot of uh, um, things, uh, you know, associated uh, activities associated with the mangroves. And uh, accordingly, you know, uh, say encroachment should not be there. Destruction of uh, mangroves uh, should not be there. Aquaculture, you should give it a thought. You know, how do you do it? Tourism is something that can be regulated in a very good way. So uh, some of these activities, if they are given due attention, uh, definitely, you know, it helps in complete, uh, um, uh, say, protection of the mangrove ecosystem and providing all the ecosystem services in a very well balanced uh, manner like that. Yeah. So there's a question from uh, Manasvi. So she is asking how the uh, mangrove ecosystem uh, carbon sequestration need to be considered. So the, uh, I came to know that soil has higher carbon sequestration than uh, uh, biomass. So hmm. how to differentiate this, uh, these two uh, carbon quantification? Uh, see, there is a, a process where you evaluate uh, the soil or the, you know, uh, mangrove uh, carbon potential. So uh, there is carbon that is trapped in the soil, plus there is carbon that is there in the plant, living plant. So uh, there are chemical processes that we have to study. The, the standing stock has to be evaluated and accordingly, you know, you, uh, you do uh, this thing, the carbon stock potential evaluation, basically. So it is a long process and uh, there are several methods. It is not just about organic carbon. It are There are several other aspects also that are associated, which you need to uh, study in study while evaluating the carbon standing stock of the thing. Uh, yeah, the soil contributes in a good amount because it forms a sink. But uh, if there is mangrove, it is something that it supports in forming the sink over there. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I request yeah. participants, if you have any question, uh, please say, uh, feel free to interact with the audience, sir. Yeah. Is there any questions? Oh, sir, there is one question from Aparna. Sir, what happens after corals hmm. are dead? In Andaman, I witnessed few uh -huh. areas of dead corals, but I'm sure what happens uh see uh, corals something like you know after they are dead if it is something like uh, mass destruction and all that you know they just become skeletal things then they just erode and it becomes part of sand sort of thing uh the destruction of corals also happens because uh, uh, they are extracted for several purposes they used to be extracted for uh, even cement preparation you know uh, putting it in cement and all but uh, that is banned but uh, yes when they are dead Gradually, they just, uh, you know, the erosion happens and it becomes sand particles and all that that happens. But uh, that's a natural process that can happen like that. Yeah. The corals, the beautiful life forms that exist over there do not get supported. So the entire thing also just gets wiped off. The other thing associated with the corals. Yeah. Looks like uh, there are no further questions, sir. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing your vast knowledge. Yeah. So uh, we look forward yeah, for, uh, you. for your uh, interaction as well as your uh, knowledge sharing in your, in future. So I also yeah. thank all the participants who have shared their uh, questions as well as uh, uh, the comments. So with this, uh, I thank everyone. And uh, on behalf of uh, AICP at Industry of Science, we thank uh, Dr. Goldie for sharing his uh, uh, valuable insights on mangroves and also the uh, requirement for conservation and he has highlighted the opportunities for conservation as well as uh, uh, 
the uh, significance in terms of the social as well as ecological and in terms of economics also so i thank uh, one and all for uh, your active participation so i request everyone to subscribe to our youtube channel so that you will get uh, all the notification regarding the our uh, future webinars so uh, with this i am ending here thank you dr goldin and uh, thank you one and all thank you so much thank you thank you i will leave now yeah